How many of you excited it's Mother's Day? Say amen. amen. Yeah. How many moms in the house stand up? Say amen. 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 All right. Hey, well, hold on. How, how, how many of you got a mom in the house? Stand up and say amen. <laughs> It'll, you'll get it in a minute. It's all right. There, everybody should have stood up on that last one. So, <laughs> I, uh, I above all, I'm going to tell you some of my philosophy on Mother's Day. I think it's awesome because my mom was phenomenal. Uh, this, this week actually is the five year anniversary of her passing. Uh, her funeral was on Mother's Day. Oh, no, no, no. No, no, please don't do that, because honestly, for me, it was the greatest thing, because every Mother's Day, I wake up thankful for my wife, thankful for my daughters that are mothers, and beyond measure, thankful for what my mom taught me. So early on, when I started pastoring, um, I grew up in church, and so early on in pastoring, what you do in pastoring is you just do what those before you did, thinking that it's the right thing to do. Anybody else getting that, that, that issue? Like it's the reason we do Thanksgiving, the reason we do some, that somebody, uh, the other day, I'm, this is going to be random. You guys okay with random for a minute? So I'm driving behind a truck the other day and they had a trailer hitch on it, which I have a hitch on my truck. But there was a tennis ball covering the hitch. How many of you have seen this? Okay. Does anybody know what the heck that's for? So when you, uh, hold on, hold on. I need one answer. The, the tennis ball is not going to stop it from hurting if you hit it. Okay. What, what you got, Brandon? You can see the bright yellow. Would everybody agree with this? How many have, somebody has a different explanation? Keeps your ball from rusting. So your trailer what? No, it rusted out. Okay. Well, I sat here and that's not what I thought about at all. I didn't even think about that one. I, I thought, who was the first person to go, son, grab me a tennis ball? <laughs> and how much impact that guy had on trailer hitches around the world now, right? I, I was thinking about this, my mom, so we do what we, we're used to doing. My, my mom was a pastor's wife and I grew up in church, and so every, every parental holiday, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Mother's Day, Father's Day, we would do this thing where it was always the same thing. We would always do three prizes for specific moms. And I said, okay, mom. She's like, please, I gotta ask you this one thing. You, you, you just gotta, you gotta, I said, what? She's like, oldest mother, youngest mother. <laughs> Mother with the most kids. I'm like, yeah, they're the ones that get the flowers. And she's like, it's dumb. <laughs> and I thought, mom, you're the, you're the pastor's wife. Like, if there was anybody that was in a position to change this, this, you could have changed. She's like, oh no. She said, where we go to church, you don't change things like that. And so I was destined to create something different. And so we have, but... But I, I asked her, I said, what's the big deal? What does it really matter? And she said, A, no woman wants to be like, absolutely, I'm the oldest one here. <laughs> I'm like, good point. And she's like, and with culture today, sometimes it can be a little awkward if you happen to be the youngest mother and the situation isn't that great. She said, and I never felt like it was right to put somebody in that position. And I said, hadn't thought of that. She said, you're not a mother. Said, yes, ma'am. I said, what about the most kids? And she said, is that really a competition? <laughs> this time we only had four and she didn't, you know, and I said, no, I don't guess it is. She said, and besides, she said, how many people in your life have stepped into that role since we've lived apart from each other? She said, I live 12 hours away from you, bud. How many times have you had people that you needed a hug from or you needed encouragement from? And how many women stepped into your life because I couldn't in that moment and were that person for you? And she said, and 
they didn't birth you as their child, but they treated you like a son. And it just changed my outlook on, on these days. And as much as I, hey, listen, if you're a mom here, good on you. I'm proud of you, proud for you. Hope your kids are awesome, okay? But if you're not, man, the value that God has in you for the people that you reach and touch is equal, is equal. There, there's, there's none of this at the foot of the cross. It's right here. And I'm so thankful for all the people in my life that have stepped into not only my life, but my children's life as well, church grandparents that, I mean, my first pastor, there were Sundays, I didn't know where my kids were until three o'clock in the afternoon when another family would call and go, oh, I figured you should know we grabbed the kids from the church. <laughs> You're like, you were an awful parent. I'm not de denying that. Um, <laughs> Uh, but those people still to this day, my kids will call back into their life because of the influence they had on them. So whatever role you play, biological mom, adopted mom, my mom was a biological mom of three and we adopted a fourth and he is every bit, every bit a part of our family because my mom chose to do something different. Jennifer and I are blessed with kids, but we also adopted because we chose. It wasn't just those that came from us, it's those that came to us that we decided to parent and mother and encourage and lift up and build up. And so for those of you that do that, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Honor to all of you, all right? So, yeah. Um, we're also honoring grads at the end of this service today. People that are graduating high school, give it up for them. <laughs> Titled the, to the sermon today, Stories of Great Maturity and Incredible Immaturity. And I figure we'll get moms and graduates in there, right? <laughs> That's not the title of the sermon. I was just trying to think through it. Man, if you're graduating, good job, you made it! Unless you're going to med school, then you just started. <laughs> if college is next for you, go get it. Have a ball, but not too much of a ball. All right? If you're going into the workforce, praise God for you. We need you. All right? Go work hard. Go work as unto the Lord. Uh, I was seeing one of my best friends from back in high school. and we, we, He graduated a year before I did, and we used to spend a ton of time together. And we were talking about, he pastors a church in Mississippi and, and we were talking the other day and he said, uh, he said, man, aren't you glad that they didn't have cell phones back in our day? And I said, Jesus, yes, yes, I am. And he said, I was thinking about that one time. It was after your graduation. I said, yeah, we went to the ballpark and played home run derby. And I said, yeah, he said, yeah. He said, you remember when we left the park? And I was like, yeah. I said, you tried to see if you could throw faster than the car was driving. He was like, yeah, broke my windshield. I'm like, I know, awesome. Like, <laughs> wasn't my windshield. But literally, he was driving. <laughs> he was driving and reaches out the window. He's left-handed, driving here, gas pedal. <laughs> it throws the baseball. <laughs> it's the windshield. <laughs> His dad nearly killed us. So, so incredible immaturity. Okay, <laughs> you're going to have moments if you're graduating, you're going to have moments you have no idea what to do. Don't feel bad. Your parents have the same moments today. Amen? Amen. Keep God first. I've told this to my kids since I started dropping them off at kindergarten. Keep God first and go be awesome. Just go be awesome in whatever it is that God calls you to do. Whatever it is God calls you to do. Again, there's nothing less than just whatever it is, do it as unto the Lord. All right, y'all ready to preach today? Matthew or Mark chapter 10. Turn with me in the Bible if you would there. Mark chapter 10. Uh, you guys give it up for Pastor Nick that preached last week to you. Didn't he do a good job? Good, good friend of mine. Love that dude. So thankful that he stepped in last week and preached for us. Kicked off big day. A big day, and I really appreciate how he set the table for that. A big day really may be a single day, but that one day ends up starting your day one. And some of you, are, you're in that season, maybe as a graduate, your day one starts, and you're now what? You may have not thought a thing about it until today or until graduation happened, and you're just sitting there kind of spinning right now. That's all right. You're allowed to do that for a little bit. 
You're not gonna have everything figured out. Moms, guess what? If you're a mom of toddlers, if you're a mom of teenagers, if you're a mom of adult children, if you're a mom of infants, I get it. You don't know it all. They haven't wrote a book that's got it all in it yet. And just about the time you read the book, you realize God didn't give you that kid. He gave you some other demon possessed child. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay. But you're not going to get it all. But there are some things that I think are really critical. I think they're really important that we get. We see this man, blind Bartimaeus, and we call him blind Bartimaeus. The Bible just says there was a blind man named Bartimaeus. And we, we've tagged him with blind Bartimaeus. And so as Bartimaeus was, was there and he's sitting on the side of the road, he was about to have his one day. He was about to have this moment with Jesus, this big day with the Savior. He wasn't expecting it. He was just sitting out there doing his day to day. He was sitting on the side of the road begging as anybody would. Most likely would have been sitting on the side of the road and as people would have been throwing to him, he was blind. And as a blind man, you don't want anything too far off to the sides. You want it to come right to you. And so he would have probably sat with his cloak spread over his legs and they would have thrown change into his cloak. It wouldn't have been a cup because you could have lied about the cup. You could have thrown a rock in there and he might not have known the difference. And so he would have sat there with this before him and that way he'd have been able to feel it quickly. And that was his day. That was what he did every day. I also don't speak on moms on Mother's Day or typically dads on Father's Day. And the reason I don't is because, again, a lesson from my mother. My mom said, Vince, I grew up and I've gone to churches my whole life where on Mother's Day, you either get told how awful you're doing as a mom and they preach out of Proverbs 31 and you're like, I'm never going to be that lady. I'm not going to, this is, I'm not, <laughs> man, her husband speaks good of her. Her children speak good of her. The day is blessed by her waking up. What? Some of your moms are like, I cussed all the way to church this morning. That is not about me. It is not about me, Pastor Vince. And so my mom was like, and so she, saw, she told me, she said, don't ever preach Psalm, or Proverbs 31 on Mother's Day. I'm like, okay. And she said, and don't beat them up. I'm like, mom, I don't want, she's like, in fact, I would just tell you, don't even preach about moms. And I said, wait, you're taking the flowers away. And now I can't even preach about moms. And she said, let me tell you as a mother what's really important. She said, you can spend 30 minutes preaching about moms and everybody there will be really thankful that you spoke about moms. They'll be really glad that you did. They'll be really sentimental and it'll be nice and they'll look at their mom and they'll smile and they'll wink and they'll nod and then they'll go take her out to food afterwards. Now, none of them really decided where they're gonna eat. They're still waiting for mom to tell them where she wants to eat. <laughs> Guilty of this. But, and I said, okay. She said, let me tell you what they want you to preach. And I said, what, who wants, she said, what the moms want you to preach. I said, that'd be great. And she said, Mother's Day is the one day where a lot of kids will come to church with their mom. And I said, yeah. And she said, preach Jesus. She said, just preach Jesus. And so that's what I've done. In the sermon text today, you're not going to see a mom highlighted. You're going to see Jesus highlighted. I pray in the day today, moms, I hope you feel celebrated. Grads, I hope you feel celebrated. But the reality is we are here and forever will be here about Jesus. I said, don't sweat it. Listen, we got the she shed down here in the corner. It's got macaroons and drinks and drawing for bog bags and different stuff like that. You just got to swing in there, fill out a ticket. You get in the drawing. Aaron's going to announce it later on today. We got you as far as the stuff goes, all right? Father's Day, we'll throw some bacon down. or I don't know what we're going to do for Father's Day, but listen. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I speak Jesus over the bacon, Pastor Ben. <laughs> but whatever we do, the message is going to be Jesus because it's the thing that matters most. Mark chapter 10, starting with verse 46, I believe, is where we're going to dive into. And it says, and they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving, this is Jesus, Jesus is leaving with his disciples, notice the cut here, and a great crowd. He's got his followers, but then he's got a crowd behind him. And this crowd behind him is not there really to hear anything from Jesus. They just want to see the stuff. 
They, they just want to see what he does. They want, they want to see what he comes up with. They want to see what, what, is he going to heal somebody? Is he going to, is he going to make the blind see that uh, whatever it happens? I, I, we want to see that what Jesus has to do. Some of us treat Jesus like this. We don't really talk to him a lot until we need a miracle. We, when, we, when we need something in our life, boy, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But in the times when, when it's going well, we're, we're not really communicating with him. I think that's why we see this. There's Jesus, his disciples, those that are with him for the run. They're, they're with him. And then there's a great crowd. And they're with him. And they're coming out of Jericho. Bartimaeus a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting on the side of the road. I just want to say, we should go back to the biblical process of naming our kids. Because <laughs> the word bar, if you see the word bar in front of a name in the Bible, it means son of. So literally, Bartimaeus means son of Timaeus. And so they just took Timaeus' name and we're like, bar, bar, cool, Bartimaeus. Now, I don't know who would ever want to be Bar Vincent. <laughs> but if in the Bible you can read this Bartimaeus, Barabbas, Bartholomew, like think about that poor guy whose name was Tholomew. <laughs> you got to be son of Tholomew. It was awful, but hey, it was easy. They didn't have to think about it much. But there's blind Bartimaeus sitting by the roadside. And when he heard, verse 47, that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He got loud. Why? Because Jesus was coming. Well, does he know Jesus? I don't know. He knows something's up. He can tell there's a crowd moving by. He can tell he's probably heard the rumblings of this Jesus. But hey, if there's a chance, I want to throw it out there at him. Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then I get tickled at it because it says in verse 48, and many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. Shh, shh, cut it out. Cut it out, cut it, stop. Shh, you're being too loud. It's Jesus coming by. Oh, it is? <clears throat> and Bartimaeus, all the more, son of David, Jesus, it's me, have mercy on me. And there were a bunch of church people that got really upset because he just got louder. Y'all know anybody in your life that just gets louder? Are there any of you that just get louder? Like that's your argument? I always get tickled when we go to foreign countries, especially as an American. We go to foreign countries and we assume everyone's deaf and needs us to speak slower. Right? We, we went to Mexico and I couldn't help myself. I'm like, my name! And they're like, what are you doing? They're not going to understand it any better if you slow it down and turn the volume up. And I'm like, I'm an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> it's not what I was saying about you, Joe, even though your wife just said you were the one getting louder. <laughs> this is what happens. Bartimaeus is sitting there and he's saying, okay, here I am. I know, but I, I want to give you just two points today. And the first thing is in Christ, in your life, when the struggles come, when life hits you, you've got to speak up. You're going to have to say something. And Bartimaeus knew something was happening. That's why he said it the first time. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Hey, be still. Be st no, 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 no. Listen, I don't know what can happen, but something might happen. So I'm going to take my shot. I'm taking my shot. I'm going to speak up. And we struggle so much for some reason with this in our day-to-day -day life of just speaking up for Jesus. We speak, well, we'll, we'll say things or we'll assume things. I don't want to say anything. Why? Because they're probably not going to listen anyway. How many of you have ever done that? Oh, I think, I mean, I don't know if Jesus wants me to have this, so I won't say anything at all. I don't know if my spouse wants this. I don't, I don't know if this is really where I need it. And so I'm just not going to say it. No, speak up. 
speak up. My kids, they're required. We require them about the time they are able to get a job that the government will allow them to go to work. And if we can find somebody to pay them under the table before the government will allow them to go to work. It's just a joke. Go to work. Go to work. And it's so funny because you watch kids and they go in and try to get a job and they're like, I don't want to go in there. Like, why? Because they they're probably not going to hire me. Probably not going to. Why don't you go in and ask? I don't know what to say. You say, hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm looking for a job. Are you hiring right now? Is there an application? Or what days do you do interviews? That's it. That's all you got to do. That's all you got to do. That's all you got to do. <sighs> so weird. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, not, it's not weird. It's, it's called a conversation. And listen, if you own a business, please let that still work. Don't send everybody to online. Let them come in and ask you. Okay, it's a quality we're losing where people are able to have face-to-face -face conversations. And so, so I said, hey, just go in, just go in, just go. Dad, I don't want to do that. I'm like, I know you don't want to do that, but here's the deal. <laughs> you have to do that. I am tired of giving you movie money. They just bumped the prices. It's 10 bucks to go to the movie now. And if you take a date and you ain't got a job, I'm sorry. So dad, I got You got to go. All of our kids have had to do this. All of them. Okay. We're about five in now. The only one that doesn't have a job yet is Brent. Okay. But I'm praying for her. Okay. She's <laughs> Caleb's working on it. He's, he's, he's going, but, but I, it's one of those things. Now, here's the thing. Here's me as a parent. Some of you may disagree with me. That's okay. It's not a parenting sermon. <laughs> That's why I don't preach on Mother's Day. <laughs> Once they get a job, they don't ask anymore. I, I don't tell them what to do with their money, but don't come ask me. You, you, pay the, you fill your car with gas. If you need to go to the movies, you got money, right? You, got, you worked, right? Yeah. Where's your money? Uh. So I just started adopting that. Dad, can I have some money? Uh. <laughs> but in order to get there, here's the glorious part of it. When they walk out of a place and that place said, you know what, we are looking. We do need somebody. We'd love to have you. When can you start? And they walk out of that place. Like literally there should be theme music because they're like, da da da. They're holding the uniform like they're going to love it. You're going to hate that thing, but still. <laughs> they're walking out with some pride, with some appreciation. Why? Because they went in and spoke up. Did they know what was going to happen? No, not entirely. Think about what Bartimaeus' phrase was. He didn't say, Jesus, son of David, heal my eyesight. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on I just need you to hear me. That was the statement. I just need to know that you're willing to stop on your way. Would you have mercy on me? And he stops. And you say, well, yeah, but what was he expecting? I don't know that Bartimaeus was expecting anything. He just figured if I don't say something, I don't have a chance at all. Because I can either say something or I can keep sitting here. I can either speak up or I can stay sat down. But one, there's a possibility that something amazing happens. And one, nothing changes at all. I think we get real comfortable with nothing changing at all. To the point that we quit asking God to do amazing things in our life. We quit asking him to show up. We quit asking him to do some great things. God, heal my marriage. Not, Lord, if she'd just get her head on straight. No, that's the wrong prayer. Lord, if he would, no, 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 wrong. You started wrong. Lord, have mercy on us. And I'm speaking up, God. And when somebody tells me I just need to walk away, I'm not going to listen. I'm going to speak all the more louder going, Lord, I trust you in this. And I want you to have mercy. And when it gets to the place where I get to you, then we can have a talk. Then we can have a talk. We're going to talk about that here in just a second. But you got to start by speaking up, speaking up and speaking out. Hey, Jesus, it's me. Oh, well, Pastor Vince, he knows where I am. I know he knows where you are, but he would love to hear from you from time to time. Some of you have taken this salvation by grace to a place and you've made it to where now I don't even have to talk to him. Well, I've been saved. That means I get to go to heaven. If that was your only end game, you are missing so much of who Jesus is. So much of what Jesus is. If that's it, if that's all you're hoping for, Man, are you missing it? 
Come talk to me. I, I'll put you in some people's life groups. I'll set you down at lunch with some folks who have seen Jesus come into their life and radically flip the whole thing upside down to the point where they're good here as long as it takes Jesus to come back because this is good when Jesus is in the middle of it. It's good when Jesus is in the middle of it. Oh, does that mean they're blessed financially? Does that mean they're, no. <laughs> no. It means they have Jesus in it. Now listen, I'm, I, I don't believe in magic, all right? Unless the magician explains it. <laughs> but I don't, I don't want you to miss this because we're gonna get into this in the next part of this, the next point. We see that this blind Bartimaeus, he speaks up and everybody just shushes him. Hey, you just get quiet, you just get quiet. And he, I, I, I don't know what his facial expression was. I don't know. You know how sometimes we don't want conflict because it means we have to look somebody in the eye? I don't know that since Bartimaeus was blind, he didn't worry about that. I'm serious because he was like, I don't know who just told me to be quiet, but hey, <laughs> Jesus, it's me. Will you have mercy on me? And then Jesus stops. Picks up in verse 49. And Jesus stopped. Just think about those three words. Think about that, that you as a child of God, you as somebody that may not be a child of God, but are seeking God, you have the ability to hit the brakes in heaven because he wants to hear from you so badly. Blind guy on the side of the road collecting coins. And Jesus stopped and then says, call him. And they called the blind man saying to him, I love the attitude shift here. Take heart, which means cheer up. <laughs> Be of good cheer. It's, it's awesome. So glad you said hello. No, <laughs> a minute ago, you were telling me to be quiet. Take heart, get up. Jesus is calling you. I want you to catch verse 50. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Sometimes we read these scriptures, these Bible stories, and in our mind, because of the paintings that we've seen or the images of Jesus we've seen, we tend to beautify the story. You know what I mean? Like some of us think like Jesus' robe was white and he always wore that purple sash and his hair was amazing. <laughs> Am I right? Like right now, if I ask you for Jesus in your mind and you get a picture of Jesus in your mind, some of you are either seeing Jim Caviezel, you're seeing the dude from Chosen or a velvet painting at your grandma's house. <laughs> Am I wrong? That's what we do. But we do this with scripture too. And we think this picture where Jesus calls the blind man and he's like, hey, tell him to come to me. And then Bartimaeus stands up and floats angelically over to Jesus. <laughs> we forget a huge part of this story. He's blind. <laughs> he's, he, he's not walking directly anyway. Unless someone grabs him and brings him to Jesus, someone's getting poked in the eye while he's walking through the crowd. I'm going to tell you, listen, when you cry out to Jesus and he calls you, please take this to heart. It might not be a pretty walk to get there. You're going to trip over some stuff. You're going to fall down on your face and prayerfully someone in the crowd picks you up and goes, no, you're close, bro. You got it. Come on. Keep walking. Keep walking. We got you. You're going to make it today. And you go do something with the fact that Jesus answered you. Jesus, I called you, but you didn't do anything. Neither did you. That's right. You called him and he gave you the ability to get up and you sat there. That's right. And there's a problem because he's not a genie, he's a God. He's not a genie, he's a provider. And so when we see this God who says, tell him, to come here. Why didn't Jesus just go to him? Because some of the best lessons we learn are in the falling down. 
are in the stumbling on our way to Jesus are in the scratches and the bruises on our elbows when we had to get back up and we had to fight a little bit. But Jesus called me and so I'm getting to him. If I gotta push somebody out of the way that told me to be quiet, I, that they're getting out, I've gotta go. Why? Because Jesus told me to come here. In your life, has Jesus called you? You've been sitting here in a service on some Sunday and this preacher that doesn't read your mail, that's not friends with you on Facebook, has no idea what's going on in your life, sits right in your lap and speaks God to you. Believe me, I take zero credit for that. I just thank God that the Holy Spirit still takes and says what I say or takes what I say and speaks it into your heart exactly how you needed to hear it, not how I said it. Okay, listen, that's, it's not me, but here's the deal. You have had that because I've seen you. I've heard you, boy, Pastor Vince, you're talking right to me and you have no idea how many Sundays I want to look right back at you and go, what'd you do with it? Did you just sit there still on the side of the road with your cloak on going, well, he said, he said, come on, Jesus spoke to me. Yeah, but you're still sitting there blind. Yeah, I know. He told me to come here, but that was, that was a lot. That was a lot. I mean, that, I was, I mean, I mean, I'd had to throw my cloak away and I'd had to change some stuff in my life. Something would have, there would have been, there would have been some things that needed to be different because blind men don't walk in crowds. So maybe it's, I mean, it's cool that I heard him. Like I can tell that story that I, I cried out to Jesus. And you miss. Because they said, take heart. Get up. He's calling for you. He's calling for me. Yeah, I don't know where he's at. Well, get up get up and go to him. I don't need, I need some help to get to him. Well, obviously you can't see him, but get up. Well, I'm not sure if anybody's going to help me get up. Well, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can do, I don't know if I can do the life group. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can serve on Sundays. I don't know if I can be at church every Sunday. Get up. Stop giving the God who created you excuses about the life he blessed you with. Get up and go to him, run to him, trip over everything in the path to get to him, but get to him. He gets to Jesus and Jesus says this to him. Jesus said, what, what do you want me to do for you? I think there were people in the audience that were blown away by that question. That crowd sitting there going, what are you talking? What do you mean? What do you want me to do? He's blind, Jesus. Isn't it obvious? Sometimes I think the obvious isn't always the answer. Some of you are struggling with your life right now. You're struggling with your marriage. You're struggling with your kids. You're struggling with your job. You're struggling with everything. And if somebody looked at it from the outside, they may pick an obvious thing, but the reality is there's something down deep in your heart that's broken. And Jesus isn't the kind of God or the kind of savior that just wipes off the surface. Bartimaeus, what do you want? You made it here. You fought through that crowd. You fell down a couple times. What do you want? Oh, master, rabbi, that's what he says. Let me recover my sight. The words there are critical. Notice it says recover. That lets us know that at one time in Bartimaeus' life, he knew what it was like to see. He knew what it was like. Jesus, if I could just see clear again. Some of you are followers of God and you've just got stale and maybe you need this prayer. This, Jesus, if you just recover my sight, I wanna see you clear again. I want all this stuff out of the way and I've tripped and stumbled and, and cussed and been bruised and beat up a little bit on the way, but I'm here, God, make it clear again. Make me, let me see again, make it clear again, God, please. And it says, and immediately, Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. I want you to catch something real quick before I close. There's an important part of the story where Jesus tells them, tell him to come to me. They say, take heart. 
get up, he calls for you. And Bartimaeus took his cloak, which as a beggar, that would have been everything. That would have been his pillow, his blanket. It would have been the thing that protected him from the elements. It would have also been the basket that he collected his money in, his donations in. It would have been everything. And when Jesus calls him, he throws that to the side. And then the rest of the text, we never see him go back and grab it. Actually, it says once Jesus heals him, he follows him. Guess what? Jesus was walking away from where the cloak was. See, sometimes, folks, when Jesus calls you, you got to be willing to lay aside some of the stuff that you determine is you and allow God to begin trimming it off so that more of him is seen than any of you. So you got to lay the cloak aside. You got to lay your attitude, your personality, your desires. Your, you say, but Pastor Vince, I have hopes and dreams. His are better. I promise, I promise they're better than anything you could think or imagine. In fact, that's one of his promises. Beyond anything that you can think or even imagine is the goodness of God. Some of you are stuck on speaking out, speaking up, and you need to get up. 